Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for being here and being interested in KSERF. Um, I also know many of my team, team members are watching uh, this session virtually, and I uh, want to thank for my team members and my, uh, the contributors to KSERF. Um, my name is Yu Zhui. I am the team lead of Data Science Runtime Team of Bloomberg. Uh, our team provides a data science platform with functionalities to support what Bloomberg uh, internal users need for machine learning model development lifecycle. Um, those functionalities include how to do uh, data exploring using Jupyter Notebook, how to train models using popular frameworks such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, SKLearn Extra. Um, we also manage experiments um, and do online inference. Today, I'm going to talk about the open source project we initiated together with multiple collaborators named KSERF. Um, we also run into recent problems. Uh, we want to deploy many models at scale, uh, and I want to talk about how we address uh, this scalability problem. Um, first, I want to give you a little bit of background about KSERF. Um, KSERV is previously known as Cave Serving. If you are already familiar with Cave Serving, if you are already deploying Cave Serving into your platform, KSERV is the same as Cave Serving. Um, it recently moved to an independent Git organization uh, and it now enjoys more autonomous. Um, KSERV has experienced multiple uh, important milestones in September 2019. We released the first version of KSERF um, as a sub-project under Kubeflow. Um, it was released under the name KF Serving. A few months later, we introduced it at Coupon US, um, and we spent the next year and a half to develop this project, and we released its stable uh, version, V1 Beta 1 version, in to, uh, 2021. Um, finally, last month, we renamed the project to KSERF it is a sign that it has reached the next level of, of maturity. Um, uh, here I linked to two important uh, articles and blog posts. You are very welcome to follow the links to learn our announcement together with Kubeflow community uh, and also the blog we posted on Tech at Bloomberg that talk about our journey of building a um, um, production grade machine learning model serving solution. Uh, we won't be able to achieve all this without our awesome contributors. Uh, here, I want to spend a few seconds to acknowledge uh, everyone who have contributed and collaborated uh, with us. For those of you who are less familiar with inference, uh, this diagram demonstrates a typical and also simplified model development lifecycle. Uh, normally, our users are data scientists and machine learning engineers. They will first prepare data and use a machine learning framework to train a model. And once the model is trained, uh, our user want to deploy this model into a production system. And this model should be able to answer real-time questions, such as, given two sentences, can, you, can my model tell me what is the similarities between these two sentences? or given a news article, um, the model should be able to run inference and let us know what are the topic, topics related to this news article. So how hard can it be? Um, it turns out building a solution like this is very, very difficult. Um, first, we want to think about the cost of deploying such a machine learning model. How much CPU, how much memory, how much GPU resource is needed? And when there's no request coming to the service, is there a way to automatically scale it up or scale it down? We also want to monitor our machine learning services. Uh, we want to think about how to do readiness check, how to do liveness check. Uh, we also want to produce permissive uh, metrics where, uh, which we can use to build dashboard and setting alert for. Uh, we also care about a secure, secure rollout. Um, when we build a new version of the service, 
and that break the production system, how can we automatically detect that and stop the rollout? Uh, can we uh, canary a new version of a model um, and compare the result and be able to swap traffic between the two different versions of the model? Uh, we also want to define a protocol, inference protocol. There are many different types of model server in the open source world, and how can we uh, allow users to have a consistent layer of uh, protocol to send requests using gRPC, HTTP, and Kafka? Um, there are not all the users want to run inference using real-time requests. Some of them only want to run end-of-day batch inference. So how can we support this type of users? There are also many different types of machine learning training framework. So when we do the serving step, we want to be able to serve various uh, models trained by different frameworks. Um, uh, after model is um, running inference, uh, the next step will be how can I explain my prediction? So we also integrate an explainer component into KServe. Uh, so here comes KServe. So KServe um, is a highly scalable and standard-based model inference platform on Kubernetes for trusted AI. So at the bot, uh, lowest level is our computer resource. In, um, normally in the Kubernetes cluster, we have uh, a collection of CPU, GPU, and memory, uh, sometimes even TPU. Those are the resources we have for computing. Uh, on top of all the computing resource, we run a Kubernetes layer. Kubernetes is used as a way to orchestrate and manage all the compute resource. On top of the Kubernetes layer, uh, this is over serverless layer. Uh, we use Knative and Istio to build the serverless layer. With this layer, we are able to automatically scale up and scale down according to the incoming traffic. Um, we are also uh, able to scale down the number of pods to zero when there's no request coming in, so we can release the compute resource when it's not being used. Uh, at the top level uh, is the machine learning integration layer. Um, we integrate with multiple popular model server um, in the industry. So KServe is able to uh, serve machine learning models trained by various machine learning frameworks. This is the diagram that explains the major component in case of solution. Um, if you are already familiar with Kubernetes resource, you must understand that uh, most resource is represented by YAML file. So uh, case serve is the same. Uh, we define a resource called inference. Um, the case of user can describe what kind of machine learning model they want to deploy into, um, into a system. And this request will be handled by Kubernetes API server, uh, stored into FCD, and is eventually being reconciled by inference service controller, which is the main controller of KServe. Uh, after inference service controller reconciles the incoming uh, resource, it will create the underlying major component. One of the most important component we create is the predictor, which is essentially the model server rerun. With the predictor component, um, the model server can handle incoming request and run an inference result. Um, the second important control component is transformer. Uh, sometimes users want to implement customized um, pre-process and post-process um, steps to translate data point into a format that the predictor can understand and then post-process it back to a um, format that the application code understand. So that's how the customized implementation can be integrated into KServe. Um, we also uh, have an explainer component, which is a, which use Alibi um, explainer that can is explain why an uh, inference result is produced. A very critical part of KServe is we define a um, standard inference protocol. 
This standard, we work very closely with multiple model server community, including Triton, Torch Serve, and ML Server. We make sure we, uh, the case of community can uh, um, come up with a set of consistent inference protocol to provide a unified user experience. Uh, this is a set of HTTP protocol we have defined. Uh, as you can see, we have the standard protocol for model server to check, uh, to do liveness check, readiness check, and to check if a model is ready to take incoming request. Uh, we can also uh, use this protocol to check a server's metadata, a model's metadata, and of course, most importantly, run an inference. Similarly, we have a a set of gRPC protocol uh, we can use to check the health state, server metadata, model metadata, and inference. With the standard protocol, um, we can easily integrate with multiple model server, and the client set can set requests consistently. Uh, so now we have already run case of in our production environment for a while, and now we start to run into new scalability problem. How do we deploy a large number of models in production? So let's take a look how the current approach works. So how does how currently KSERV deploy a model uh, a machine learning model? Uh, the gray box here represents inference platform cluster. And in this cluster, each of our users own their na own namespace, which is represented by the blue box, uh, the light blue box. And in their um, own namespace, they can run multiple inference services. And this inference service will fetch a model from external model storage. Uh, the model storage can have uh, can be BCS or GCS or even a HTTP service. Once the model is downloaded into the inference service, it will open up a, a HTTP endpoint uh, where user can send request data to and get an inference result back. So what kind of problem this approach uh, bring us when we want to scale up number of models? Because when, if we want to scale up number of models, we essentially need to scale up the number of services we run in our platform, uh, which doesn't scale very well. Um, and I will talk about the scalability limitations we foresee when we want to, if each team wants to run hundreds, even thousands models in our inference platform. Um, those are the limitations we are already aware of. And of course, there may be other limitations we may run into. Um, first, I want to talk about compute resource limitations. In each inference service, um, it comes with a certain amount of resource overhead. We have a sidecar that runs alongside uh, each model server that handles the uh, incoming request, produce permissive metrics. Um, it can also do certain batching and logging. Um, so those sidecar has a need certain amount of CPU and memory to run alongside the model server. So let's, uh, that's a config the resource the sidecar requires is configurable. But let's, for example, um, let's think each sidecar takes 0 0.5 CPU and 0 0.5 gigabyte memory overhead. Uh, based on this configuration, if we de deploy 10 models, uh, let's say each model has two replicas then each model's resource overhead is around one CPU and one GPU per model. But if we can figure out a way to load, load 10 models into one inference service, then on average, each model's resource overhead is about 0 0.1 CPU and 0 0.1 GPU. That's a lot of resource reduction. The second limitation we um, foresee that we are going to run into is the maximum pod limitations. Um, some of you may be already familiar with the Kubernetes default setting. Uh, on each node, by default, uh, we can run 110 pods. Um, and based on the official documentation from uh, um, Kubernetes scalability best practice, uh, we shouldn't really run more than 100 pods per node. Based on this limit, on a 50-node cluster, we can deploy around 
1,000 to 4,000 models um, based on the number of replicas we want to we, we, we want to configure per model. The third limitation um, we foresee ourselves will run into is the maximum IP address limitations. Um, I think a lot of you also understand each uh, pod has an independent IP address in Kubernetes clusters. Um, the IP address are assigned to new models, um, replicas of models. Uh, if you uh, run transformers in case of um, there need to be IP address uh, assigned to transformers and explainers, uh, let alone there are also basic Kubernetes control plane pods running the cluster. Um, uh, the number of IP address available in each Kubernetes cluster varies a lot depending on how the admin manage this cluster. Uh, but I want to point out that this is a, uh, uh, in one of the testing cluster we run a test, we have several thousand um, IP address available. And based on that uh, limitation, we can run like several thousand models. So in order to uh, solve the scalability problem, we work very closely with our collaborator from IBM, and we come up with a solution called Model Mesh. This is the diagram of Model Mesh solution. So let me walk you through it from the top to the bottom. Um, at the top, it is the machine learning application, which sends inference request into Model Mesh. Um, and one model mesh can contain multiple um, serving runtime. A different serving runtime is essentially a different type of model server. In this diagram, uh, we, there are two serving runtime available. Different serving runtime can um, produce serving solution for different type of machine learning model. Um, one co critical component in this diagram is the mesh and the pool of sidecar that run alongside the model server. So the, green, the light green box and light pink box here represent different model server. Um, and you can see that there are mesh and polar sidecar running alongside it. Uh, the, the sidecar will decide when and where to load and unload models based on the usage and the current request volumes. Um, if a particular model is under heavy load, it will be scaled across more parts. Um, you can see those little circles inside the serving runtime. They represent different models. If we take a look at model B in the, in the blue um, circle, uh, it is scaled to have two replicas. So comparing to model A, which is in the uh, green circle, it can handle more inference requests. The mesh uh, sidecar also acts as a router. Um, the model mesh store mod, a model to pod IT routing table in the FCD, in the ex external uh, FCD. So when there's inference request coming in, the sidecar will look up the routing table uh, and it will figure out which model is loaded into which pod ID and route the request to the uh, correct pod according to the routing table. Um, so you now may be curious to learn what kind of serving runtime model mesh can provide. So out of box integration, we have uh, we will provide Triton inference server, uh, which is developed by NVIDIA. Um, which is de developed by NVIDIA. This model server can serve machine learning framework uh, models trained by machine learning frameworks such as TensorFlow, um, PyTorch, TensorRT, or Onyx. Uh, we also, by default, integrate with uh, Southern's ML server. Uh, this Southern's ML server is a Python-based server. Uh, it can serve frameworks such as SKLearn, XGBoost, uh, or LightGBN. And so a lot of you may be very curious to know what kind of performance uh, of model mesh can provide. Um, if we co-locate multiple models into the same pod, will that have impact on the latency of throughput this uh, solution can provide? So we did a performance test. This performance test was done on a single node, uh, eight CPU, 64 gigabyte RAM cluster. Um, and we deploy a very, very simple string model. It's all, it, it only has around 700 bytes. 
So if we use the traditional one model, uh, one per container deployment approach, we are limited uh, by CPU and we can approximately deploy around 40 models in this testing cluster. Uh, sometimes if we uh, deploy into a larger node, we'll be eventually limited by IP addresses. But now if we move on to use model mesh deployment, we are able to compact around 20K models uh, into this testing cluster uh, and essentially run into memory limit. Uh, in addition to the density test, we also did a latency test. This latency test uh, is done um, by running two Triton serving runtimes, and we gradually increase the QPS from 25 per second all the way to 2,800 per second. Uh, each performance test will run for 60 seconds for each QPS. We also gradually increase the density of the uh, model mesh from 1,000 to 2,000 all the way to 20,000. Uh, 20, um, as we increase the density of the models, we can we notice that there's a slight increase in latencies. Um, but for single-digit um, millisecond latency inference, one worker node can support about 20k models for up to 1,000 QPS. Um, I also like to point out that this performance test is done on CPU nodes. Uh, normally, when we uh, run inference on GPU, the performance can be increased uh, dramatically. Uh, now, Model Mesh is already released um, as part of case of, of uh, 0 0.7 deliverable. So you are all welcome to check it out and try uh, Model Mesh. There is still a lot of work we want to um, continue to work on for the Model Mesh. So here is the roadmap. Uh, we have in mind in Q4 2021, um, we want to have better inference and serving runtime integration. Uh, and currently, in order to uh, use model mesh, each user namespace needs to have its own model mesh controller. So we would like to enhance this model mesh controller to support multiple namespace. Uh, Currently, the model mesh only supports downloading model from S3 storage. Uh, we want to spend time to expand the storage we support, including GCS uh, and HTTP service. Next year, Q1, uh, we want to spend some time to work on inference graph. Um, we also start to extend model mesh to support transformer, so users can plug in their um, customized preprocess and post process uh, implementation. Uh, we also want to make model mesh start to support canary rollout um, and eventually consolidate model mesh controller with the case, case of main controller. Um, so you're all very welcome to contact us by uh, visiting our website and check out our uh, GitHub um, or Slack us or just talk to me after this talk. Uh, now and I'm open to answer questions. I have uh, two questions actually. Uh, you mentioned uh, several types of constraints like CPU and memory constraints for CPU only inference. Mm -hmm. How does this picture changes when you start using uh, GPU assisted inference? I would imagine there will, there will be another set of constraints on top of this, the one you mentioned already. Uh, can, you, can you repeat the second part of How the How does the picture changes when you start using GPU-assisted inference in terms of the constraint in the system? Okay. I'm sorry, can I walk closer? So, <laughs> <laughs> so how does the picture changes when you start using GPU-assisted inference for okay. models? Think, okay. What kind of constraints or what kind of problem or bottlenecks you start seeing? Okay, so thank you very much for the question. So the question is that uh, I mentioned that th there's a compute resource overhead come with each inference service. The question is that if we start to use GPU, what's the change um, 
what kind of change it is about the um, overhead. Um, so there's nothing changed. So in this, uh, for example, if we take a look at the diagram, the model one will be deployed into a model server. So model server is the one that requires CPU or GPU for inference. So that's one independent container run inside the inference service. Um, and alongside that model server, there's another container. That's the extra container running as a sidecar requires an extra CPU and the memory. So changing the model server from using CPU to GPU doesn't really change the sidecar's uh, requirement for compute resource. Uh, yeah, but I mean, if you start using inference, then the GPU is going to be a bottleneck in this inference, right, depending on the load. So you effectively introduce another level of bottleneck or possible bottlenecks in the system. Uh, I was curious if you can see, if you if you saw those bottlenecks in inference and how do you address those bottlenecks? Uh, do you mean how when we start to use uh, GPU? Yeah, is there when a you way start to... using GPU, yeah. Uh, so, uh, do do you mean like if we start to use GPU, is there a way to use GPU resource to address those overhead? Yeah, because it's a very specific like resource. In yeah, the that's system. a very good question. So, if some of you. Um, this may lead to some discussion about slicing GPU. So currently, if we want to request GPU resource in Kubernetes, um, there's a no very straight, straightforward or easy way to request a slice of a GPU. So um, I, I know in the managed compute, in the managed Kubernetes concept, it's very easy to think about, well, I have a GPU allocated to this inference service. Can I request a slice of the GPU and just to use that for the sidecar? The answer is that, um, there's no very easy way to do that. So when we request GPU, we request a full GPU. Uh, actually, in a real use cases, very often we notice that even though a model uh, server requests a full GPU, uh, but when the inference happens, it won't really use the full capacity of the GPU. Sometimes it doesn't even use the full capacity of the, uh, the memory. So if we take a look at typical GPU, most of them come with 32 gigabyte memory. So some models are actually really small. They are like megabyte level. Uh, some larger ones, like a BERT model, maybe on um, maybe it's gigabyte level, but that still wouldn't come. That only consumes a small fraction of the full GPU memory. Uh, in terms of the computing power, sometimes is uh, even less. Um, the amount of computing power you consume heavily depend on the volume of request that you send into the model server. So when you have a, a lot of concurrent requests sent to the, to the model server that only has a GPU allocated to it, you, you can notice that the GPU consumption will go up. But during the time that there's a very small amount of volume coming to the GPU-powered model server, uh, like you, it's very obvious that the consumption of GPU uh, computing power decreased a lot. Um, I think that also really depends on what kind of model server requesting that GPU and how optimized that GPU has. Um, so that's why we um, work very closely with Triton because Triton uh, is developed by NVIDIA and they have a lot of optimization about GPU in the Triton model server. All right, thank you. Thanks. Okay, one more question and then we'll have to take our break. But as I walk over, I'll just remind everybody that we, after this, we have a break until 2.55 Pacific time, and then the sessions will start back up again. So in this diagram, um, you're talking about single model serving versus multi-model serving. Mm -hmm. So in multi-model serving, we're saying that multiple models running in a single Kubernetes pod. Is that correct understanding? Right? Yes, that's, that's, that's the correct understanding. Okay. So what we are trying to do is to collocate multiple models that can be served by the same model serving runtime and collocate them together. But isn't it a little bit uh, against the Kubernetes model reason? I'm saying that uh, <clears throat> one thing is uh, all of these models competing for the resources because you don't have, don't have isolation of resources. So there is no quality of service. One model is taking more compute resources. It will impact the rest of the uh, models. Second thing, if this pod goes down or this node goes down, all the model goes down together. 
Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, each model can take up different a different amount of computing service. Actually, that's a we internally in our working group we had a long discussion. So the original design of the solution is that each model. Uh, let me go back to the to this diagram. One of the original idea we have is that each model will have the same amount of replicas that just sp uh, spread uh, among all the replicas belongs to our model server. And then we start to realize, let's say um, we have model A and B and C in the same pod, and the model A takes most of the request. And B and C only take like one request per hour. But because of model A need to handle really high volume, so model A will drive the same serving runtime pods up into like uh, many replicas, like 10, 20, but model B and C will be forced to scale up together. So that's that's the idea like we can, we spend a lot of time discuss and that's why we moved to the model mesh idea. So we can scale up different model uh, differently. So uh, let's take up the diagram again. The model B, uh, it has more replicas. So essentially collectively model B uh, owns more computing resource in this uh, serving runtime. And model A only has one replica, so like collectively or model A only owns like less computing resource. Uh, that's why we designed the solution in a way that each model can have different number of replicas across all the parts that belongs to one serving runtime. Okay, thank you very much. And we will meet back here again at 255. Thank you.